Support funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. For Milwaukee's Italian-American community, these summer fest grounds and the area nearby are sacred. Walking on this land and into the treasured Festa Italiana means stepping into history. It's here, in the heart of the city's third ward, where the majority of Milwaukee's Italian immigrants first settled. And it's here, at Festa, where generations of Italians have celebrated their heritage in festival style since 1978 with food, fun, music, and dance. Reminiscent of simpler street festivals and a faithful sense of togetherness. For some, it's an emotional time to pay homage to even richer traditions found in prayer. and procession. And inside this simple tent, filled with almost a thousand personal photographs, something very special happens for many others. Is that it? Yeah, this one here is my, my parents. Well, mom and dad. And this is her sister Josie, her sister Frances, her brother Ron. Sometimes, returning home to Milwaukee and Festa and remembering what was can be bittersweet, as it was for Mary Losis Romaglio. I was born in Milwaukee's Third Ward in 1915. My family came from Sicily, near Palermo. My father came here in 1902, in 1904, my mother and my brother came to Milwaukee also. Not like the old days. It's okay, but when we had the street festival, and when you knew, well, of course, we knew everybody, you know, and as I say, everybody knew everybody. So like now I come back here and I don't know a soul. The old days, for the majority of Milwaukee's Italians, are where their personal and poignant stories begin. Their names, familiar or not, and their stories have defined generations. They've helped characterize a city known for its ethnic diversity and flavor. Storia Italiana Milwaukee tells of courage, hardships, faith, and family. Milwaukee's Italians cherish their 150-year-old history, a proud story they hope and pray will never end. We, the children of the immigrants, we, uh, we feel tied to that. We don't want to lose it because we were a part of it. And yet, we have to resign ourselves to the fact that it's going, it's almost gone. Milwaukee's Italian story began in the late 1800s when a steady flow of Italians first arrived in the city. Many were male artisans from northern Italy who beautified the city's grandest buildings, including the Milwaukee Public Library, with Italian marble and tile. The heaviest immigration took place between 1890 and 1914. Close to 5,000 Italian immigrants had settled in what became Milwaukee's largest Italian community the Third Ward, an area then bordered by Wisconsin Avenue on the north, Lake Michigan on the east, and the Milwaukee River on the west and south. The Germans and Irish were among the first to live in the ward, but eventually moved north and west following the devastating Third Ward Fire of 1892. Ferocious winds fanned the fire that began at the Union Oil Company on East Water Street. Four people died 
and more than 2,000 people became homeless after the raging fire wiped out 15 city blocks. It was a turning point for the ward. As more and more immigrants continued to arrive, the Italians rebuilt a community of their own in the dense, poor residential district that offered them cheap housing. The area became known as Milwaukee's Little Italy. In Italy, they were considered the lowest on the social scale, the peasants. They didn't go to school. They didn't know how to read and write. But that didn't mean they didn't have it up here because they certainly did. Men usually arrived first to find work and send money back home to loved ones. The immigrants who settled in the Third Ward came mostly from the island of Sicily, including the provinces of Palermo and Messina, and from southern Italy, regions including Abruzzi, Campania, and Calabria. Once here, they lived primarily in an area east of Milwaukee Street to the railroad tracks. Milwaukee offered these unskilled and penniless immigrants better jobs, mainly as city sanitation and utility workers, factory hands, and railroad laborers. They worked six days a week for $1 to $1.50 per day, some of the lowest wages in the city. Others became entrepreneurs in the produce business, including Milwaukee's first Sicilian, Agostino Catalano. A small park called Catalano Square at Broadway and Menominee in today's Third Ward is a daily reminder of those beginnings. The most successful merchants graduated from push carts to trucks to their own wholesale houses on a stretch of Broadway long known as Commission Row, an area that was the heart and soul of the local Italian produce community until the 1990s. There was work. That's why they settled there. We gotta remember too, well this one call that one over, call that, we call that chain migration, okay? One comes, more gets a kind of a layout of everything, and then he starts calling the others to come over. That's how it was. Another group of Sicilian immigrants surfaced in Milwaukee's Third Ward in the early 1900s. According to Gavin Schmidt's book, Milwaukee Mafia, the city's Italian crime family came entirely from the area in and around Bagaria, including Santa Flavia and Porticello. Schmidt writes that when infamous mob boss Frank Balistreri died in 1993, the city's crime family died with him. A small group of southern Italians also settled in West Allis, while a bit larger number of northern and central Italians found their Milwaukee home in the Bayview neighborhood south of downtown. There, most worked in a sprawling iron mill on the South Lakeshore. They came for the same reasons the Sicilians came or the Abruzzese came. They were dying of hunger and they needed a new place to make a new life. Probably the most famous Bayview Italian was civil rights leader Father James Grappi. He was the 11th of 12 children of Italian immigrants Giocondo and Georgina Grappi, who came to Milwaukee in 1913. They founded a general store on East Russell Avenue. Their sons continued to run it until 2003, when time came to hand it over to a new owner with Bayview Roots. Some of the Italian market's 1913 charm remains today, as does the Grappi name. Between 1915 and the early 1920s, younger families left the Third Ward for better housing in the Brady Street area on the city's Lower East Side. Still others, mostly Sicilians, remained in the Third Ward as more immigrants arrived to their new home in Milwaukee during the decades that followed. No matter where they lived, early immigrants shared an extraordinary will and an abundant amount of courage. Their journeys to Milwaukee defined their unquestionable character. How they came over in the boats, converted cargo ships, and they had to, uh, these people were relegated to, they call it the steerage area, which was below the water line. Imagine what there was down there. It was hard for them because, like, let's say that if there were Abruzzeses on the ship uh, in those days, well, they couldn't communicate with one another because they only knew their dialect. The, country, the area they were from, the Abruzzese had theirs, the Sicilians had theirs, the Neapolitans had theirs. All of them had a different dialect. My grandparents came here 
in the early 1900s. Because I'll tell you one thing, if they're not in heaven, nobody is what they went through. This photograph depicts the immigrant experience. And there she is, she's crying. She's only 25 years old on that photo. Gina Camilo Manning, a first generation Italian, is talking about her mother, Rosa Lali Camilo, who left Italy to reunite with her husband and other family members already living in Milwaukee. This photo hangs in the lobby of Milwaukee's Italian Community Center, where Gina works. Every day I see that photograph and I nod my head and, and say, good morning, mother. Have a good day. <laughs> Rosa's torn and worn passenger ticket to this country is now a well-protected heirloom that better preserves her family's story. My mother arrived here from the Abruzzo region of Italy in 1935 aboard the Count de Savoia ship. She was all alone. She did not speak the language. She was on the ship with three women that she did not know. And um, they shared a cabin for eight days on this ship to make their journey to New York. She's on the bus. She arrives in Milwaukee to meet her family. Her sister is already at the house where she was supposed to arrive to. She was placed in the cab by a lovely woman who said, I will help you. And she put her in the cab and very anxious my mother was because she didn't know what was going to happen. She was to arrive at 812 and 814 East Brady Street. And the cab driver had her name and address and he told her, do not worry, I'll take care of you. And uh, my mother, prior to arriving here in Milwaukee, had sent, this is just a replica of the curtain that was to be put in the window so that she would recognize the home she was supposed to be at. I see, uh, I'm going to see my husband, then I'm going to see my sister, and then for sure, that was just my mind that was working. So I get to the address, but I get to go. And finally, we got on Brady Street. When I saw my curtain, because I made the curtain I sent to my sister, I said, oh, I said, thank you, God. I'm on the right place. My poor sister, she was by the window. Rosa Camilo died on February 13, 2002, at the age of 91. Two months before her death, she reminisced about her immigration journey with granddaughter, Carrie Camilo, a Milwaukee native, now a multi-platform editor with the Washington Post. I couldn't stop crying. Because four years without a husband. Four years. Yeah. You hadn't seen Grandpa for four years. Four years. You made this? Yeah! And you know when? A night. For the candle. Because of doing the day, I gotta to go to work. When I saw this yank on the, on the window, like that, by the window. You recognize that? I just say, this is it. All the end by end. No, no machine? No way! I knew that they had a very difficult time and it was depression time. It was very, very tough times. Very tough times. And that her family helped her. Come in this country, you don't know the language. You don't know nothing, no money. You wasn't working. I was with my sister. God bless her. So my grandmother, Ann Mania, she was called. Uh, many people pronounce the name Magna, but she pronounced it Mania. She came over when she was 12. Her father had already been here. He came over as a young man, I believe, in his 20s. She came with three of her brothers, and they came on the boat, uh, steerage. Uh, 
uh, and they came straight to Milwaukee where her father had already set up a household and, and had a job. The reason my grandmother came to Milwaukee is because other members of her community in Porticello came to Milwaukee. They wouldn't have gone to a place where they didn't have relatives or friends. That was the whole idea. I mean, of course they were distrustful coming to a new place, but they felt that um, through the correspondence, they learned about this place. They felt safe. They knew someone was going to be there to take care of them, to help them find work. And if there was tragedy or if there was problems, you know, there'd be someone in the family or a friend to take them in, help them out. Because there was a padrone there, someone they knew, who oftentimes introduced them to the local store or helped them get a job or showed them how to vote, um, helped them find apartments and they went to the same church and the same social organizations. They lived together in this kind of tight-knit community. The first generation benefits immensely from what, having what is called an ethnic enclave, where people from your same village or your same city can um, help you navigate these new surroundings. Uh, being able to shop, being able to obtain services in your own language, while you're still learning English is what was very important. Italian culture is really regional, it's local, it's not national. Those people didn't think of themselves as Italian. They associated with whether they were Neapolitan, Sicilian, Roman, and so forth. They spoke their dialect, so if you were trying to communicate with someone from a different region, it was not easy, because uh, the dialects can be very different. If you were from Abruzzi, and I'm Sicilian, and we're sitting together at the same table and what, and I figure, gee whiz, she's not as bad as they say they are. That's what happened. And what happens is even, what happens is this too, that they say, you know what? Oh, I got some bad news. You do? Yeah. Do you know so-and-so's daughter? She's a Bruzzese? Yeah. She's gonna marry a Sicilian. Oh, God forbid! This type of thing they did. The way they overcame it was by staying close to people who spoke their same dialect and had their same customs. I mean, it gave them that sense of security. was a tightly knit, self-serving community. Within the area of a few blocks, a family could obtain practice. This book of personal stories has created a sense of security for Andaleo and her family. Their mother and grandmother once wrote about that closeness growing up in the Third Ward. Some of that closeness was physical. The closely built homes were mostly frame, multiple family dwellings and rear cottages. Most houses were in shabby condition, with no shower or bathtub. Families walked to the Jackson Street Natatorium to care for their personal hygiene. Living conditions were often described as deplorable. Despite that, the real closeness came from just being together. During summer evenings in the Third Ward, porches, stoops, and stairs were filled with people. The sound of Sicilian voices was everywhere. My name is Anthony Maki, and I am, I'm 93 years old. My name is Leonard Maki. I am 83 years old. I am the youngest of six siblings. We lived at 522 North Jackson Street. It was a duplex. We had tenants upstairs. We were six siblings, two bedrooms. Now my parents had one bedroom, so that brought it down to one bedroom. The girls slept in that. My brothers, uh, uh, Tony and Peter, slept up in the attic in the summer months. There was, there was a room uh, uh, up there, finished, and uh, I slept in the kitchen on a rollaway bed. And I, in the morning, I would fold it up and put it away for the next night. There was a lot of togetherness, uh, and, and it was a happy house. There was never a lock in the homes, and we could go in and out of, 
our friends homeless without knocking. We were so welcomed. And the, and the parents took care of other, other people's children. Our dad was in the produce business, so we were never lack of fruit and vegetables in the home. We lived very comfortable compared to many of our neighbors because he was a, he was a pretty good, uh, he earned a pretty good living, my dad. We were fortunate and our household was, was pretty nice compared to some of the, uh, the homes in the third ward. It was a tightly knit, self-serving community. Within the area of a few blocks, a family could obtain practically all its food, clothing, and needed services. Grocery stores abounded throughout the ward. Eventually, my father opened a uh, pasta churia and gelateria <laughs> store in Milwaukee on Detroit Street, kitty corner from the Italian church. People liked our store because we made the best cannoli in town and we still do. <laughs> Nobody else makes cannoli <laughs> like my father did, except me <laughs> and my kids. My grandmother, Anna Mania, and later Anna Mania Dunst, I grew up the oldest daughter in a family of 10. And as soon as she was about five or six years old, she was caring for younger children. She was cooking. She was doing laundry. She was cleaning the house. That was the expectation of her. And while it was really important for her younger brothers to go to college, um, they went to, a couple went to law school, a couple went to medical school, she wasn't allowed. It just wasn't the place of a woman, a young woman, um, in those times, in the 1920s, to go on to school. In fact, she had to fight to get to high school. She talked about the piecework that she did, sewing, and how her friends weren't really spending the days as 10-year-olds or 11-year-olds or 12-year-olds out on the street playing hopscotch or playing games. They were expected to do work. All through my childhood, playing was frowned upon, especially by my father, perhaps because he had to do a grown man's work at the age of 12 to help support his widowed mother. He expected his children to help at home in every way possible. My father, a ladies tailor, told me, little girls are supposed to help their mothers remember that. Most of the girls spent their summers attending the schools set up by a number of expert needlewomen in their homes. Here they taught us cutting, sewing, and embroidering. Like most of my classmates living in Little Italy, I ate many dishes and foods at home, heavily flavored with garlic. My grandmother did talk about prejudice, about prejudice against Italians. She had a couple stories. One was um, when they first came to Milwaukee, they did not move to the Third Ward because her father wanted to um, send his kids to a school where there wasn't just Italians. And actually, after a, a, a year or so, he felt like he had to move because his sons were getting physically abused and getting beat up on the way home from school. And so he kind of acquiesced and decided to move to the third ward. Like most of my classmates living in Little Italy, I ate many dishes and foods at home, heavily flavored with garlic. That was the era when garlic was a lowly, unwelcome flavoring in polite society, synonymous with foreigners, particularly immigrants and definitely un-American. It was the look I saw on Miss Hickey's face whenever most of us fifth graders came in close contact with her. The look that made my nine-year-old self wince when I heard the whispered charge often leveled at us, little garlic eaters. I continued to suffer in unhappy silence during my years in elementary school because Papa's command was an adamant, eat what your mama cooks. You hear a lot about prejudice and racism, and it, this is a, a small form of it. Um, and even to this day, my mother, 
he uses garlic sparingly because, um, because of that story. And in my generation, um, I use a lot of garlic. <laughs> I think I'm trying to make up for that loss of garlic over, over a couple, uh, couple generations. Illiterate as many were, they found English a difficult language to learn. This isolated them from the rest of the city. Although very close to the center of activity in Milwaukee, they were in a separate world. They were the Italians. All the others were the Americans. People that came over uh, spoke a broken English and uh, um, they were looked, uh, looked down upon. Um, but through the years, uh, we've proved them wrong. I finally realized that I spoke Italian before I spoke English. My mother was here 72 years. She never went back to the old country. Uh, and she spoke broken English. So if we had to communicate with, with our mom, uh, we would have to speak to her in Italian. Otherwise, uh, we'd have a lack of communication. Uh, but she understood what we were talking about if we spoke in English. She, she made her, she played kind of dumb, uh, but she, she knew what we were talking about. Most of us went to Lincoln High School. And back in the early 20s, there was a, uh, no, early 30s, excuse me, uh, there was a football team and they won the city championship. They used to call the signals in Italian. So the opposition didn't know what was going on. <laughs> well, they didn't know when the ball was going to be snapped. So that's one way of beating uh, Leonard, the opposition. Leonard, that was a 1926 team. Okay, I said. 1926, that was the had the singles in Italian. I was born on Brady Street. Growing up in Milwaukee, during that time, I know we had many other people and friends from the Abruzzo region. When my father and mother sent me to Maryland Avenue Kindergarten, I could not speak English. And they held me back a year, my father with an interpreter saying, why do you hold her back? but she doesn't speak English. Well, that's why I'm sending her to school so you can teach her how to speak English. Milwaukee became a, uh, how would you say, a model for the rest of the country with the progressive area, it was called, where we had uh, the, uh, what do you call those? Oh, socialists came in in 1912 and a little earlier. So what did they do to help the immigrants, to help these people? They opened up social centers. They taught classes in English, they taught classes in citizenship, uh, uh, sewing, manual training, you name it, they had it. It was through the uh, influence of the social center that the Italians be began to feel themselves part of the whole scene. We know that the, the pressure was for them to assimilate earlier in the 20th century, and the city tried in many ways through community centers uh, and even through festivals to sort of encourage this idea of, yes, you're Italian, but you're also American. So Italians were very uh, eager to serve in both wars. They were, uh, they enlisted in the, in the Second War more than any other ethnic group in the city. The pressure to become American was there I do see the ICC as a modern day social center. I mean, you still have um, you know, a lot of people that meet there on a daily basis and have lunch together. Or they'll play cards or you know, they play bocce. They do all that kind of stuff. Um, so it is a social place. Italians, Sicilians, we're all one community within the Italian community center. And I think that ethnicity, that's why we're all such proud people. 
We're proud to be an Italian. The Italian Community Center came up because there were those that were from the Third Ward that remembered the old festivals and remembered the camaraderie. The profits from Festa Italiana was the impetus for us to build an Italian community center and also to buy the property down there. That's a lot of property that we own, 16 acres. So, uh, in fact, years ago, they had a, a sign that they used to put out every Festa on our building. This is the house that Festa built. This is the house of God immigrants built and decorated some 85 years earlier. The Blessed Virgin of Pompeii Church on North Jackson near Clybourne shepherded Milwaukee's Italian community for more than 60 years. Various religious societies donated money in honor of a specific patron saint to help pay for the church. Substantial monetary donations from wealthy Milwaukeeans helped the Italians finance the rest of the $10,000 needed to make Pompeii Church a reality. Archbishop Sebastian Mesmer laid the cornerstone on October 9, 1904. For the church's 50th anniversary in 1954, the outside Cream City brick was painted pink, following a tradition of pastel-colored churches in rural Italy. From then on, it has been affectionately known as the Little Pink Church, as originally described by the Milwaukee Journal. The church that seated several hundred worshipers became a huge, faith-filled hub of prayer and fellowship. Sunday was a special day. People arrived dressed in their best even before the church bell had announced the High Mass. They met outside to chat with friends and neighbors. In the church, all the men and boys sat on one side, women and girls on the other. The parish priest gave his sermon and the announcements in Italian. We were baptized there, we were uh, confirmed there, we uh, had First Communion there. A lot of us were uh, altar boys and the priest made sure that we were uh, taken care of uh, socially. You know, we, we'd play ball. Uh, they, they had uh, a big room in the basement of the church. We would uh, have boxing. Later on, uh, the priest brought a projector and a screen and he would show movies, religious, of course. In Europe, in any community, the church was the heartbeat of the community. It was the gathering place. Life started there and life ended there. 1905, 1906, one of the groups that came from Italy honored the Holy Crucifix and they were the first to have a festival in the Third War. No one else had ever done that. When we had a festival, regardless if it were the Italians from West Dallas, Third Ward, Brady Street, or Bayview, they came to the festivals. They enjoyed the festivals. Now, what were these festivals made up of? Well, we had, um, all the delicacies that are at Festa Italiana now. And of course, the non-Italians that came into the Third Ward had their first taste of pizza, of calamari, of whatever else they might have, cannoli. That's how it all started. And they would shoot off these bomb, aerial bombs, as salutes to the saints. Well, people walking down Wisconsin Avenue thought, well, what's, what are those crazy Italians doing down there? Well, they came down and fell in love with it. To have a procession of a religious statue in a secular place down the streets of the Third Ward, that's why at Festa we now have also the Mass in procession because that was the quiddity of, of the festival was the Mass in procession. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
faith was very important. I think uh, to this day, people put some validity into their religion, uh, uh, reason being uh, uh, they were brought up that way and it was instilled in them uh, from childhood. And uh, I don't think too many strayed away from, from their beliefs. In the late 1960s, urban renewal changed everything for Milwaukee's Italians. Their beloved Little Pink Church became the center of controversy when city leaders decided to tear it down to make room for highway expansion. The congregation desperately tried to save their church, but their attempts failed. On July 30, 1967, parishioners held the last procession and high mass at the Blessed Virgin of Pompeii Church. Eight months after the city declared the church Milwaukee's first historic landmark, the wrecking ball showed up. The Little Pink Church met its fate in early October 1967. The loss of the church left behind a trail of crushed spirits in the community. An historical marker on Jackson between Clybourne and St. Paul is all that's left as a physical reminder of the Little Pink Church. Emotional scars remain for many. Perhaps it was divine intervention that St. Rita of Kasha Church on Pleasant and Cass Streets in the Brady Street neighborhood became the new faith home for more and more of Milwaukee's Italians. Immigrants founded this rather intimate church back in 1939. Today, it's part of Three Holy Women Parish. Rita is the saint of the impossible who had a very difficult life of her own. We celebrate God's goodness to us as at the beginning of Mass, we trust in the power of God's everlasting love. She sustained it through the power of undying faith. And, and so what I see in terms of Rita as the saint of the impossible for us here is that we have to stop, we have to stop thinking so much about fear. And we have to start living more in hope. Jesus being lifted up on the cross and taking all of us with him on the cross but what I see here is, is just the people that have stayed here, they're so wonderful. I have wonderful parishioners. And they, they really are, are, are ultimate in hospitality. They love their heritage. But when I came on as the Polish, I was the first Polish priest of this parish ever. Before, the, in fact, the priest that was my predecessor was German. He was the first non-Italian that was pastor of this parish. What I've seen is um, a great amount of adaptation. And what we're seeing now too is that with even the old timers, they're seeing the pews fill up now, and they, they like seeing the youth that are coming. So our church is filling with youth again, and, and they like the sense of the young people, who interestingly enough, love all the traditions, though they might not have the emotional, intellectual access to them as to how they came about. They love it when they come in here and they feel that sense of Italian hospitality, the camaraderie, the catching up before mass begins, the chatting, but they also love the statues. They love the, the tradition of the procession. They, they, they love that, that fact of tradition, which I think what's happening here, so the older people over here are kind of the core group that may, might be getting a little older, are finding some joy because they're seeing the traditions passed on. So the presence of a co-ethnic community makes it very easy or easier to uh, transition into a new, a new country. Uh, but over time, the need for such a, a strong ethnic community declines because the second, third, and fourth generation attain better, better and more education, better jobs. And when they do that, they, they desire to have better housing. And that better housing is frequently found outside of the, you know, the, the barrio, the, the, uh, the enclave, and thus it's very natural for the, uh, the younger generations to move away, move into the servers, and, and that in itself is evidence that they have achieved mobility, that they have uh, achieved the American dream. It's sort of like a evidence of success when those ethnic neighborhoods disappear. They eventually assimilated to a more American identity and moved on, many of them to the suburbs, but still keep ties to the city and many of, of them still go back to the church in, in the city, like on, on Brady Street. They go to church there and they buy the groceries from Gloriosos. 
I think at that time, you had more, more of this family. We were all Italians. Then the children grow up. Maybe they marry non-Italians. Now you kind of break up. We still want to teach them the way we were brought up but that you lose that as the generations go on. But for us, it was a common thing to have the big pasta dinner on Sunday or a seven course meal that an aunt was making somewhere else. And that was common every Sunday. We'd be doing something with family. So I think there might, might have been a stronger family relationship at that time. Whereas today we're all so busy. We're all busy. I know how I was raised, and you try to use that on your children, which we, I think we did, and not married to an Italian, but we still, he still, George will still understand me if I say some words in Italian, certain words. <laughs> I don't feel that the younger generation has any concern whatsoever about their past. Maybe when they're older, they might begin to look to it. Oh, my hope is that they carry on the experience. I mean, just the Italian Community Center, the culture, and everything that we do there within the community. I hope that they feel they can't leave it all up to the elderly. We need some young people to carry on what we started. You know, my goal is to try to drive uh, the younger generation back in, you know, let them understand that, you know, this is your culture, this is your heritage, this is who you are. Primarily like to see, you know, people be more engaged in the sense that, hey, you know what, this is what I'm about, you know, and this is, you know, I, I, I take pride or I, I strongly believe in what my, you know, my ancestors did for us. I think the fact that I am a little bit younger and that I can relate a little bit more to the younger generation and you know what their expectations are or what their you know what their beliefs may be that you know what we should be doing as an organization I'm hoping that I'll be able to you know communicate better with them and be able to attract them better. Being a teacher for 20 years you're always talking about how this generation is different from the last. I mean what I like to see these days it's happening in the Irish community and the Italian community and the German community is those old names are coming back. You know, kids, Italian American kids aren't um, named Joe and Mark as much as, as they were two generations ago. Mario's are coming back and my daughter's Lucia. And I think that reflects going back to an earlier time, you know, they want to, even if they don't know a lot about their, their um, family stories, they're proud of who they are. I'm Vincenzo Salvatore Balistrieri. I'm 25 and I'm proud to be Sicilian. My middle name, Salvatore, is named after my grandfather, Sal Balistrieri, who grew up in Milwaukee and who started our family business, Balistrieri Trucking, uh, right here in the Third Ward. He felt prideful enough to give me a name that reflected where we came from. Uh, so I think being able to carry that on uh, is a good feeling. There is a psychological need to connect with your roots. And as a professor, I see many of my students looking for that connection. There is a distinct difference in the Italian culture between being Sicilian and being Italian. Uh, and having a name like Vincenzo, people are often like, oh, you're Italian. And I, I always correct them that I'm Sicilian. Uh, and it is a joke now with my friends that if someone says, oh, you're Italian, they are the ones who immediately jump in and say, no, he's Sicilian. And we all laugh about it. The Little Church of Pompeii, which is a, uh, a cornerstone to the Italian culture in Milwaukee, is where my dad went to church when he was a kid. Uh, and when that church shut down, um, they moved a lot of their activity to Festa, uh, and they're still a cornerstone to the Milwaukee, the image of the little church, pink church of Pompeii. Um, and my dad began uh, ushering mass at Festa, and uh, when I turned 15, I, uh, he had told me, you know, a lot of the older generations are falling off, um, you know, people like your grandfather can't uh, walk through the procession from one end of the Summerfest grounds to the other. Um, we need younger people like you. So then uh, my brother and I stepped up uh, and we've been doing it for 10 years ever since then. In a very uh, not overt way, it's a way for me to beat my chest a little that I am Sicilian and that I'm proud of being Sicilian and that I'm proud of Festa and I'm proud of 
uh, what we're doing. And though I never had a chance to attend uh, the Little Pink Church, that uh, I understand that it's part of where we came from. I think younger generations um, have to be proud of where they're from and have to be excited that uh, the foundation of the reasons we have Festa and the reasons we have the ICC and the reasons that uh, we can eat great cannolis and have great Italian bakeries in Milwaukee is because of our grandparents and because uh, when they came here they were proud of where they're from and they didn't want to lose their culture. So understanding where we came from and being proud of the fact that our ancestors have done something, have settled something, have created something that will live in Milwaukee for a long time. Uh, I think understanding that is what will draw in the younger group. Language is the way in which one generation hands down the traditions of a culture to the next generation. Once you lose the language, you lose a, a good part of the culture, of your awareness of the culture, the nuances of the culture. Pronti! Pronti! Partenza! Partenza! Via! We chose to send our two boys to the Italian Immersion School here at Victory um, because First of all, we truly believe that learning a second language of any shape or form is imperative, especially in today's workforce. But having my husband's background coming directly from Sicily, having my background um, as well with the Italian culture, we felt it very important that our children learn to speak the language, read the language, and also write the language. We go back to Sicily about every two years, three years. So in order for them to communicate with their cousins and their grandparents and their aunts and uncles, we just felt it imperative. And, and the learning mind, it's, it opens so many other doors for them as well. Que dice? Que dice? Que boy. Carrying on the language so that it doesn't get lost. Some of the dialects don't get lost. Um, and carrying on the culture and the traditions is imperative for my boys because that is part of who they are and what makes them who they are and I want them to continue carrying that on with their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. Tell me, chiamo Gino. I like Italian because it's fun, because we always speak that. I like going to school here because next time I go to Italy, I know what I'm saying half of the time. My name is John Mook and I'm five years old. I like a tiny one because my mom and dad. I was born uh, in, in uh, Nassau, uh, which is a small town, but uh, I'm from Cabo de Orlando. It's a region, the uh, Messina region, uh, on, on, uh, on the north coast of Sicily. And um, I came here 23 years ago. There is a thing so you want to keep it from uh, your tradition, from your roots. All my family on my side lives in Italy, and uh, some of my family, they speak English, but not everybody does it, especially in the old generation, they don't speak English. So it's very important for me when the kids, they go back to Sicily or Italy or wherever they go, they can speak Italian. Whatever level you learn the language, you can never recapture the ethnic life that your forebears lived grandparents, great-grandparents. You can never go back to that. The ethnic identity you're going to recapture is going to be partial. So you're not going to live it every day. So you get to choose how ethnic you want to be. Siamo pronti? Si. Si. Pronti? Pronti. I don't believe that ethnic identity can just go away. Um, it has shaped every single one of us as Americans. We Skype every Sunday with other family members and they connect through our Facebook pages with their cousins and we listen to the Italian music and we dance the tarantella and we um, make the kudura for Easter and so it's they don't know anything different to them that's their normal that's our normal as my boys are first-generation Italians, um, I have seen them 
be ridiculed at times for when we're speaking to them in public. People have turned around and looked at us and said, speak English. And my comment always is, I speak English, but I'm very proud of speaking the Italian language as well, because that's part of who I am. Milwaukee's Italians are, without question, proud of who they are and even prouder of their roots. Italians make up just under 4% of the city's population today, behind the German, Polish, and Irish. Numbers aside, their imprint in the Milwaukee area remains strong. Italian culture continues to pepper Milwaukee's landscape with restaurants, shops, and Italian-based arts and entertainment. But for these people, there's still nothing more important than family and finding meaningful ways to continue the Italian story. I think people remember their stories. I mean, I have stories with my grandmother I'll never forget. What I love a lot about her is that um, once she was independent and was married, she was free to go to college. And she did. She strapped her young child on her back. She went to what was down her college. Um, she got a degree and she became a teacher. And she taught Italian, she taught French, she taught Spanish. And she kind of inspired me to be a teacher. I try to cook like my mother taught me to cook. I grow my own tomatoes for, for canning and I make sauce and my children wait. They wait for that sauce and the smell of the sauce as they're coming into our home. It's a challenge, but you know, going back to what the older generation feels that it's dying off and it's going away, um, I don't believe that to be true. It's all in what they instill in their, you know, kin, you know, their 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 kids and their grandkids. You know, if they if they are, if they're very supportive of who they are and what they believe in, then they should keep passing that along to their families. You know, as ours did to us. Well, I think the, the Italian community here in Milwaukee uh, had a tremendous and still has a tremendous impact on the city uh, from the point of view of entrepreneurs like the Bart Bartolotas and the, uh, uh, the Gloriosos, the in terms of uh, civil rights leadership in, like Father Gropi and many others who have been politicians and city leaders. So the, their impact has been tremendous. Uh, the leadership in terms of the Festa Italiana, uh, and festivals around the city, so it's, it's obviously that they have had a large impact on this community. If I had to live my life all over again, I wouldn't change it one bit. I've had a good life here. I've enjoyed my life in Milwaukee. Here we are, we, we, we made through all those struggles and uh, uh, I think we're better people because of it. Uh, uh, we went through tough times and uh, now we enjoy the pleasures of life today, and uh, we enjoy them and we appreciate them. Tradition, that's the name of the game, tradition. Italians are great people. Sogno contente di essere italiano americano, nasciuto e cresciuto a America. Mi piace italiano. Sono felice di essere italo americano. Sono felice di essere italo-americana. Sono orgogliosa di essere italiano. I'm proud to be an Italian.
Support funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.